Psychological Types, or the Psychology of Individuation, by Carl Gustav Jung. Translated by Helton Godwin Baines, 1882-1943. In presenting this, Jung's crowning work to the English-speaking world, I would like to make a brief sketch of the curve of the author's thought, for like everything that is rooted in reality, Jung's standpoint shows a definite line of development, and the following of this progression may add a historical sidelight to the understanding of the present work. I would have preferred to avoid the troubled waters of controversy, but it does not seem possible to relate the history of Jung's standpoint without at the same time contrasting it with that of Freud. That this somewhat thankless task was necessary is proved by the still frequent coupling of the two schools of thought under a common denomination, suggesting that the general mind has, as yet, failed to make a clear distinction between the contrasting standpoints. Freud, undoubtedly, is an analytical genius. One has only to read his early studies upon the ideology of hysteria to be struck by the virtuosity of his subtle reasoning. It was an intuitive capacity of no ordinary shrewdness that revealed the hidden significance of the hysterical syndrome, for it opened the way to an entirely new conception of the unconscious, and led to a rediscovery of the dream as a significant and purposeful product of that same unconscious activity of which the hysterical manifestations were a somatic expression. Freud was like a master detective, tracking down the incriminating complex in the unconscious while Brewer, his colleague, contented himself by exercising the repressed elements from above by abreaction under hypnosis. In medical science, we can discern two main human types or attitudes whose behavior towards the therapeutic problem presents a characteristic contrast. The chief interest of the one lies in the welfare of mankind and the healing of his patient. The other's interest is monopolized by the ideological problem presented by the patient's condition, and is concerned in a less degree with its remedy. The one attempts to discover a remedy before understanding the problem. The other tends to become so completely immersed in the problem that the original objective, e.g. the healing of mankind, is often lost to view. We do not find the greatest minds succumbing to either of these frailties, but it is not out of place to outline such typical predispositions, since the vague benevolence and imperfect understanding of the one are as far below the scientific desideratum as are the other's exclusive ardors for the scientific chase, a blemish upon the ideal of humanity. While Brewer, therefore, seems to have been content with the therapeutic efficacy of hypnotic abreaction, Freud found in this procedure merely a starting point for a further investigation of those avenues which the abreactive material opened out. And, as he rather naively admits, no one was the more surprised than himself to observe that this further investigation of the patient's subterranean activities produced valuable therapeutic results. It is, of course, true that some of the most beneficent therapeutic measures have been discovered in precisely this way, as incidental by-products, as it were, of the process of scientific investigation. But for the purpose of comparison, it is important to stress the fact that Freud's approach was preeminently that of the empirical investigator, because it is in this attitude that we find both his strength and his limitation as a psychologist. We will return again to this point when the picture has been more fully outlined. While Freud was enduring the obloquy of the psychological pioneer in Vienna, Jung was approaching similar conclusions from a very different angle in Zurich. By a further elaboration of the word association experiments formerly employed by Galton and Wundt for other ends, he succeeded in the most delicate task of devising objective criteria for the recognition of unconscious complexes. The discovery of prolonged reaction time, perseveration, etc., associated with the effect-toned presentations led to his invaluable formulation of the complex, from which he advanced to the same fundamental concept of repression which Freud had reached by the clinical route. This naturally brought the two pioneers together, and Jung found in Freud's masterly analytical technique the admitted high road to the unconscious processes. Insofar as it was purely a question of method, Freud and Jung found themselves in harmony, 
but the study of psychological processes can never remain a mere question of method sooner or later it must challenge the investigator to produce a philosophical standpoint and here a basic psychological difference began to make itself felt freud the empiricist wanted to limit his psychological principles to empirically ascertainable matters of fact on the lines of orthodox scientific determinism he preferred an exclusively causal and reductive account of the psyche jung on the other hand appreciated the fact that man was more than a variously disordered object he was also a self-creating subject he argued that the causal explanation cannot be regarded as exclusive in the psychological realm since the final or purposive explanation finds equal justification in human experience he began to feel that the inevitable sexual interpretations however widely the term might be stretched were too poor a rendering of the passionate and infinitely diverse aims of the human soul in harmony therefore with robert mayer's conception in the realm of physics he developed the energic conception of the libido thus lifting the whole subject from a one-sided purely empiricistic standpoint to the level of universal concepts where science and philosophy are able to understand one another the actual point of divergence between the two standpoints occurred significantly enough over the question of the mother imago as is well known freud's interpretation of the mother image in dreams is exclusively referred to the actual mother or the mother surrogate jung contended that the almost magical influence of the parent imago with its supreme dynamic effect upon the whole course of a man's life not only shaping his actions thoughts and relations to the world with secret and invisible determination but also creating the figures of the father and mother deities in his religious and fantasy life could find no final explanation in the actual events of infantile and adolescent experience the difficulty was admitted by freud but the acceptance of inherited racial experience as an integral factor in psychic life opened such menacing vistas involving frank disaster to the comprehensive system he had devised and was prepared to demonstrate to the world that he resolutely shut his eyes to the possibility of this boundless and primeval continuity he was only prepared to explain the discrete individual psyche and jung's conception of the collective unconscious opened the door to unnamed things from the jungle and primeval forest it introduced a world of unknown elemental forces which must be unconditionally excluded from a scientific system but apart from the considerations above alluded to jung's argument was incontestable the lungs of the newborn infant know how to breathe the heart knows how to beat the whole coordinated organic system knows how to function only because the infant's body is the product of inherited functional experience the whole story of man's struggle for adaptation to life his whole phylogenetic history are represented in that knowing how of the infant's body is it then blindness or fear that urges us to deny to the infant psyche that same functional inheritance which is so manifestly present in the other organs what is this dark fear of our archaic past which prompts us to reject the possibility of any psychic experience other than that of our individual lives at all events it is clear that once the existence of these inherited psychic structures is admitted as the basis of psychic activity that conception of the unconscious and its contents which regards it as derived exclusively from objective experience in the single individual life must go by the board here then was the alternative which from the historical standpoint we must regard as crucial either jung's conception of the collective unconscious must be admitted and with it the whole inner world of the subject wherein the inner images or archetypes are granted an equal determining power with the objects of the outer world or the one-sided empirical system must be maintained with its somewhat arbitrary postulates and the whole disturbing vision of the collective unconscious be rejected as a fantastic impossibility jung's great work psychology of the unconscious was the final statement of his separation from and advance beyond the freudian standpoint and freud's reaction to this work made it clear that he too recognized an inseparable opposition 
for in this work jung did not confine himself to a reduction of the miller fantasies to their instinctive roots he also identified the personal themes with universal religious and mythological conceptions thus raising them to a level of general importance but in so doing he also proved the necessity of the synthetic standpoint in analytical psychology a demonstration that bore unavoidable implications unfavorable to the freudian position that the divergence between freud and jung must sooner or later have become acute will i think be clear when we remember that between the two men there existed not only the difference of race but also a radical difference of type an extrovert by his very nature is bound to produce a psychology differing essentially from that of the introvert for freud the aims of empirical science with its centripetal bias towards a minute and detailed analysis of observable facts were absolute whereas for jung a purely objective psychology was not enough in that it entirely omitted the undeniable reality and power of the idea this is not the place to enter into a discussion of the relative values of the extroverted empiricistic and the introverted abstracting attitudes in human thought the struggle of these two elements as jung shows in the present work is synonymous with the history of human culture they are both essential as mutual correctives and it is only when either tendency becomes a one-sided habitual attitude that common sense steps in and makes its inscrutable judgment in science these two general tendencies appear as the twin capacities of empirical observation of facts and of intellectual abstraction from the facts observed of generally valid principles but only in the man of genius do we find both capacities fully and symmetrically developed in my view criticism of freud's achievement should be based not upon the fact that he failed to perceive the possibility of a general application of his ideas this he apprehended only too clearly but upon his inability to frame concepts of general validity he attempted to make the infinitely complex phenomena of the psyche harmonize with theories intuitively derived from clinical material but he was unable to enlarge or reconstruct his theoretical system to embrace the wider aspects of human experience and culture the normal was considered in terms of the pathological a gradual but very definite movement of intelligent opinion away from the freudian standpoint at the present time is in my view a common-sense reaction to the damaging depreciation of essential human values in this reductive valuation of the psyche for the reductive standpoint fails to see that every complex is janus faced and that the energy invested in it is never purely regressive but is rather a reculer pur mieux sauter the extraordinary vitality of the infantile complex would be quite inexplicable on the supposition that it was a wholly regressive tendency but it demands a synthetic standpoint to perceive that every dawning possibility in life is heralded by the image of the child the symbol of eternal youth and that the infantile complex with its simplicity and trust in life is also the growing point of the developing personality every child perceives what the investigator may fail to see that a living man in his most eager and productive moments exhibits certain essential characters of childhood creative activity demands the power and complexity of the man as well as the simple attitude of the child but jung himself deals so fully and so much more ably with the limitations of the purely reductive standpoint that i need not elaborate this aspect of the subject here it has been argued that psychoanalysis does not claim to be more than a therapeutic technique and a method of research and that it is irrelevant for the psychologist to concern himself with the question of human development or with the inevitable ancillary problems of morality religion and human relationship in this very argument the essential limitations of this standpoint stand self-confessed since a psychology that excludes the most vital problems of life from its fear of responsibility requires no further criticism it is already moribund actually of course a psychological nihilism which broke down every individual form into its elements and put nothing in its place could not conceivably have anything but disastrous therapeutic results 
but Freud does put something positive and definite in its place, for there always remains the transference to the analyst, which in the case of the positive transference involves a gradual assimilation by the patient to the analyst's general attitude to life, and in the alternative case, a very definite rejection of the man and all his ways. This unconscious identification with the analyst is quite outside the sphere of the latter's control. It is inherent in the analytical relationship. But for the analyst to wash his hands of this unconscious effect with its far-reaching moral influence upon the patient's subsequent development is as irresponsible as though a surgeon were to shut his eyes to the inevitable dangers of hemorrhage and sepsis. The question of moral responsibility, therefore, is inherent in analytical practice and since this is so we have every right to demand of a practical psychological system that it shall attempt to discover the fundamental laws of human development and as far as possible to formulate them we said at the beginning that freud was an empirical investigator and that this was both his strength and his limitation it is his strength because it required the empirical attitude to discover and establish the psychoanalytic technique. And it is his limitation, because the general attitude to life, which is governed solely by objective facts and considerations, is quite incapable of judging man as a subject. If, as Freud points out in Totem and Taboo, human morality can be traced back to the first primeval act of parricide, a derivative of some remote arboreal conflict between the parents authority and the son's lust for his father's wives then morality can exist only as a constituent of herd psychology and the individual moral law is as much a delusion as is free will to a determinist it is obvious that a purely objective standpoint must similarly interpret all the realities of the inner world as mere derivatives or reflex of the objective facts man is wholly determined therefore by things outside himself he is nothing but a singarate, a mere mechanism that gets out of order, and by an appropriate use of the correct method can be put right again. This standpoint is well illustrated by the Freudian interpretation of dreams, which always explains the dream figures as carefully disguised images of real people or concrete things, quite ignoring the possibility that such things may also be symbols of subjective realities existing in their own right the freudian standpoint then in attempting to explain all the phenomena of human psychology in terms of objective facts remains one-sided and the extent of its limitations may conceivably be measured by the intolerance with which it discusses or ignores every standpoint that ventures beyond its circumscribed terrain since there have always been large numbers of men for whom the objects and experiences of the psychic life bear more immediate sense of reality than the world of objective facts it is clear that a purely objective account of the psychological processes could not win any considerable support beyond the specialized limit of its own peculiar faculty but however much the historical eye may regard the wider subjective valuation and synthetic method of hume as the inevitable response of psychology to essential human demands the greatest honor must none the less be given to Jung, for not only was he the first psychologist to perceive these demands, but he also voiced them in principles whose universality could embrace the heights and the depths of the psyche and comprehend its manifold diversity. In establishing the two typical mechanisms of introversion and extroversion together with the main categories of human types, based upon his fundamental antithesis, Jung has demonstrated the impossibility of every attempt to formulate a generally valid theory of human psychology which ignores these typical differences. For a theory whose validity is incontestable for the psyche from which it originated proves itself worthless and even misleading for an individual of another type. From considerations such as these, we must confess our inability to devise any rigid or dogmatic formula which can be authoritatively promulgated as a general system of psychological therapy. A physician once justly complained to Jung that he had made analysis so difficult. It is certainly true that the pronouncements of Freud relieve the analyst of a very considerable onus, 
he is not required to ask himself what is the individual way of this particular subject he has merely to reduce his patient's psychological material to its elementary constituents according to prescribed orthodox formulations and if the patient is not satisfied he either proves himself psychologically inadequate to receive the truth or so immersed in his morbid state that the analytical light serves only to reveal its impenetrable obscurities in his subtitle to this book jung has called it the psychology of individuation and therewith he affirms the essential principle of his philosophy for to jung the psyche is a world which contains all the elements of the greater world with the same destructive and constructive forces a pluralistic universe in which the individual either fulfills or neglects his essential role of creator the individuality is the central coordinating principle of this realm analogous to the principle of royalty in the nation and in so far as this coordinating will achieves an effective command of the diverse and conflicting elements which constantly tend to disrupt his kingdom we are justified in speaking of a differentiated individual the individuality is universally present but as a rule it exists mainly in the unconscious often finding expression in dreams and fantasies in some royal or princely figure it is a principle therefore which has to be created out of the unconscious by accepting individuation as a deliberate and conscious aim it may be asked what has individuation got to do with the treatment of nervous disorders this question springs from the assumption that there is no fundamental relation between the realities of the psychic life and the symptomatic conditions of the body and yet the lives of religious founders one and all bear witness to the fact that the healing of the body is not unconnected with the inner life if differentiation and coordination of function are admitted as the vital principles of organic life it is difficult to see how one can regard psychic or functional disorders as anything else than a statement of the relative suppression of these principles in the individual in question the psyche therefore has to be considered as a totality and not as an ill-assorted collection of instincts and faculties for if man is not a mere passive mechanism to be shaped to the pattern of a chosen formula he stands before us as a self-creating subject whose individual way may be directly opposed to the analyst's most cherished theories it has often been leveled against jung that his is a pedagogic system that he tries to teach people how they should live how they should settle their problems instead of merely indicating the unconscious state of affairs and leaving them to find their way out we are told that the physician should confine himself to a purely medical aspect of the case and that to voice any criticism which might suggest a definite moral or religious standpoint is to encroach upon other domains for which he has no qualifications this point of view is very common and has a certain justification supported as it is by the whole traditional constitution of society but in spite of an argument apparently so overwhelming the individual psyche persistently overrides the social categories and notwithstanding every rational attempt to regard it in terms of mechanisms and functions its claim to be considered as a whole has never once abated since this claim appears to have a socially subversive tendency and occasions very real fear in a great many minds it might be well to examine its character if we assume and without this assumption no system of psychotherapy has any reasonable basis that a neurosis is an act of adaptation that has failed we are faced in an individual case with the question what is the nature of the reality to which this individual has failed to adapt the materialist would fain have us believe that the only reality demanding psychic adaptation is represented by the sheer concrete facts of the physical environment but if concrete facts were the only reality there would be no spiritual problem and consequently no neurotics the minimal adjustment to objective conditions demanded by social life could present no insuperable difficulty to any one but an imbecile unless there were another reality of a very different nature always competing with the concrete world for prior claim upon our energy the other psychic or spiritual reality which comprises the inner life of the subject 
is as constantly demanding new forms and expressions of its energy as is the world of external objects even though it does not make the same compelling demand upon our attention the fantastic hallucinations of the delirium tremens patient or the paranoic are equally strong evidence for the reality of these inner claims as are the ecstatic experiences of the religious mystic only in the former case they are seen from the reverse side for this reality the evidence is necessarily subjective the snakes and frogs seen by the patient in his delirium however delusional to an objective valuation possess an undisputable reality to the man himself clearly therefore there are two quite different kinds of reality both of which while pressing their respective claims upon our capacity for adaptation are nevertheless mutually dependent in the case that neglect or disregard of either eventually destroys the validity of both again thousands of lives are fruitlessly spent in a neurotic attempt to escape an overpowering parental influence just as there are innumerable lives seeking a release from the unconscious tyranny of collective authority the need of the growing child to differentiate himself as an individual from the magical parental influence is essentially the same as the individuating impulse to distinguish oneself as a single separate person from the collective en masse but the developing child who seeks to adventure beyond the magic circle of the family encounters not only the authority and conservatism of the older generation but also the far more dangerous inertia and infantilism of his own psychology in either case it is essentially the same conflict between the individual and the collective elements whether within or without and what could prevail against the authority without or the inertia within but an inner necessity or law whose incontestable superiority can stand firm against every attack the genuine rebel in his resistance against the law can win our sympathy in spite of ourselves notwithstanding every rational resistance the inner superiority enforces our recognition of its power the genuine neurotic as opposed to the social deserter is typically a man who cannot reconcile the claims of traditional forms and values with those of the obscure but unbending law within for him the inner and outer claims are contradictory and mutually exclusive in answer to the persistent demands of the social tax collector he can only guarantee the overdue payments to caesar when caesar shall first have recognized the paramount claims of god for such a man to be delivered over once again to the orthodox representatives of traditional values whatever the formula may be is merely to hand him over to his creditors before he can do justice to traditional forms or fulfill his social task he must first submit himself unconditionally to the fundamental law of his own being this is his stronghold this his root in an enduring reality and with this security he can go out into the world not only to settle the old imperial demands but also perchance to reanimate the forms that are with the vision of what he is to be to the critic then who charges jung with pedagogic interference we would reply jung does not teach a man how he shall act or think or live but he gives him a technique by which he can comprehend and finally submit to the laws of his own nature the basic principles of human development are not vested in any faculty they have no academic formula for they embrace every function of human activity they are commensurate with life it is not surprising therefore that it is from just those quarters where authority reigns and where truth is already congealed into a dogma that this particular criticism usually springs it is easier to teach and practice a formula than to try to interpret the meaning of life but a rational formula is doomed from the outset because it tends to seduce men to turn away from the enigma of life by offering them a formula in its stead thus it opposes life and its inherent destructiveness determines its own fate no psychological formula can ever explain life at its best it can only present the living process in a thinkable form to our reason as soon as it claims to have explained a living process its effect is destructive since it interposes an authoritative ready-made explanation between the individual and the real problems life presents 
thus apparently relieving him of the need to seek his own individual solution this is what jung describes as negative in contrast to positive or creative thinking for what we call character is nothing but the measure of sincerity with which an individual creates a positive adaptation to the essential problems of life a formula is an artifact a rigid and arbitrary frame into which the plastic and changing forms of life are impressed the resistance of the unconscious to this imposition is perceptible in the impassioned dogmatism of the man who has accepted a formula as an explanation of life a principle on the other hand acquires its validity not from the authority of the man who lays it down but from life itself whose manifold processes it correlates and brings into abstract form formulae live and die like their authors one might almost say with their authors whereas the validity of an abstract principle is just as durable as the processes it embraces and comprehends it needs neither authority nor defence it bears within it its own prerogative jung's analytical interpretations are admittedly based upon the principles established in the present work but practical application of them i e their translation again into life rests wholly with the individual subject the individuality is the alpha and omega of jung's system not however as an expression of personal power as the egoist would like to interpret it but essentially as a function of the whole this in itself sufficiently disposes of the pedagogic critics for a system which aims at individual autonomy cannot justly be described as pedagogic naturally there could be no interpretation at all without a standpoint in practice therefore the most that we can humanly demand is that the standpoint of the analyst should constantly be oriented towards the individual way or greatest ought of the subject it is of course true that however generally an analyst may strive to realize the same his interpretation will to a large extent be subjectively conditioned this is psychologically unavoidable but the very sincerity with which he strives to interpret the fundamental needs of his patient from the material at his disposal must surely make for individual autonomy whereas the opposite standpoint that would reduce psychic experience into terms of arbitrary mechanisms must inevitably tend to standardize mankind because in this case the main criterion of judgment is the relative measure of conformity with the orthodox formula from the point of view of social economy there can surely be no two opinions that a psychological technique whose aim it is to create individuals is of greater value to society than a system which aims at conformity for an individual who is at one with himself seeks a creative collective expression from inner necessity while the dragooned neurotic is of as little service to society as an unwilling conscript but how it may be asked can a physician learn to forego the customary collectivized view of his fellow-man and train himself to an unprejudiced view of his patient's individuality unobscured by his own unconscious projections it will i think be clear that before a physician can fully recognize and respect the individuality of his patient he must first have given allegiance to this principle in himself this does not mean to say that only a differentiated individual is fitted to practice analysis such a condition would disqualify every candidate but it does demand that the analyst shall himself have been analyzed and shall have made a sincere attempt to deal with his own life problems before undertaking to deal with those of his patients the aims of the individuality can never be fully apprehended by exclusive reference to the biological or instinctive life of the subject in fact just as little can they be explained in terms of instinct as a work of art in terms of energy one might attempt to formulate the chief aim of the individuality as the effort to create out of oneself the most significant product of which one is capable on the biological plane this is clearly the child but on the psychic level this must be interpreted more broadly as something that bears for the individual in the fullest sense of the term a significance at least analogous to that of the child for the greatest individual value is always pregnant with value for mankind hence the budding personality with its potentialities for good or ill is frequently represented in dreams in the form of a child 
the whole symbolism of rebirth is quite unintelligible from a purely biological standpoint hence a system that is blinded by its preoccupation with purely instinctive interpretations presents a definite obstruction to the whole transforming or spiritualizing tendency of the libido the obvious prospective significance of the rebirth symbolism in dreams is to my mind so apparent that one is tempted to accuse the reductive school of willful blindness but this would of course be quite absurd and one has to remind oneself that the dream like the lily of the field is a natural product unassisted by human intention and that it is quite as rational to regard the lily as a fortunate accidental grouping of basic organic elements as to conceive it as a symbol of purity the standpoint therefore eventually decides the interpretation as it also decides the manner in which the interpretation is employed i have now revealed a very practical motive which prompted me to bring this whole question of the underlying opposition of standpoint into the foreground of discussion this attempt although foredoomed to excite controversy will i hope in spite of the obvious inadequacy of such a brief outline help to clarify the situation in a way that a more cautious and non-committal statement would fail to do the great value of the present work lies in the fact that it is a mature and conscious survey of the psychological field viewed by a mind of unique range and development whose astonishing wealth of psychological experience illumines the whole work the range of jung's thought has developed with this experience the psychology of the unconscious was the shaft of the tree this work is its ample spread for practical psychologists it must assuredly be regarded as the foundation of the science for in no other work do we find basic psychological principles whose validity is commensurate with the undeniable facts of man's historic development and the realities of individual experience the actual translation of the work was a task of such difficulty that i often despaired of giving the book an adequate rendering into english fortunately i had exceptional opportunities of assistance from the author himself for whose unstinted patience and generosity in listening to my translation week by week and offering invaluable suggestions i cannot be too grateful for most valued assistance in the various preparatory stages of the work i wish to tender my warmest acknowledgments to my wife to mrs lillian a clare to mr john m thorburn of cardiff university and finally to mr w swans stallybrass of messrs keegan paul and company limited my publishers for whose friendly offices and indefatigable care in the matter of punctuation and typography throughout the book i offer my very cordial appreciation with regard to the use of italics in this book i wish to explain that with the exception of titles of books italics have been reserved to denote stress had all the numerous foreign words occurring in the text been printed in italic type in accordance with english typographical convention the special value of this type from the point of view of the author's meaning would have been lost our only other alternative was to use quotation marks but in many places foreign words occur so frequently that this would have served merely to blur the page and confuse the eye there are a few exceptions to the above rule the reasons for which will be obvious double quotation marks are used for actual quotations single marks for indicating philosophical terms used in special senses façons de parler etc for the fact that with the exception of the quotations from kant i have nowhere availed myself of existing english translations either of the oriental or the european authors quoted in the text i must plead my residence in zurich where the various works were inaccessible h g baines twenty four camden hill square london w eight end of translator's preface